Okay, welcome back everyone to my round eight recap from the Buell Chess Festival. I have a really interesting game today. Uh, and coming in, I was playing Romain Gamelli from Switzerland, rated 21-20. And I wasn't sure what to expect in the opening because he's been playing a few different things this tournament between Queen's Gambit and uh, Ready. So game started and he played d4, I played d5. We went into a Queen's Gambit, and in this position, I had seen he had one game previously this tournament where he played bishop to g5, but in this game he played a different move, pawn to g3. And this is the beginning of the Catalan opening, and it's not something I prepared specifically for my opponent. And when he played this move, I had a kind of a sinking feeling in my stomach that he was probably pretty well prepared for what I usually play against a Catalan. And I usually like to play uh, somewhat of a sideline, is d takes c4, bishop g2, bishop e4 check, bishop d2, and c5. I've uh, probably played hundreds of games with this online, also a good handful in tournaments. Uh, this is what I like to call the Ray Robson variation, and uh, it's one of my favorite openings against a Catalan, but I did not want to be going into it against someone who probably prepared it very thoroughly with the engine. So going back to this position, I decided to go into a different line. And I started here with bishop to e7. He played bishop g2, castle, he castles, and then I take on c4. And this is actually a more kind of mainstream main line. But after next few moves, uh, he plays queen c2, I play a6, preparing to meet queen takes e4 with pawn to b5. Uh, then he plays pawn to a4. Uh, in this position, I played a really rare move, uh, that move being pawn to h6. And I just want to show the database here. If we go back to this position, uh, this has occurred almost 5,000 times according to the Lee Chess Masters database. And the move pawn h6 has only been played in two of those games. Now, I'm pretty sure there's been more games recently with this move. And I actually prepared this exact move for an earlier opponent of this tournament, uh, Grandmaster Sashi Kiran. Uh, but in that game, he played e4, uh, surprising me on move one. So it was nice that I was able to save some secret opening weapon for a later game. And when I played h6, my opponent uh, started thinking. And the idea of this move uh, is pretty nuanced, but basically I'm waiting for white to take on c4 with the queen, after which I can play pawn b5. And the tactics work out because white, white can't really take because after he takes, I hit the queen and I'm winning material here. So uh, yeah, h6 is somewhat of a waiting move, but it's also a useful move in the position, preventing bishop to g5. So after a bit of thinking from my opponent, he played the move rook to d1. And I was still prepared here because uh, Sashi Kiran actually had a game with this move. And I played knight c6 relatively quickly. And in this position, uh, there are a few moves for white. I'm pretty sure the top engine move is bishop to d2, which is definitely not the easiest move to play. But first, it looks like it gives a pawn. But the idea is after takes, 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 there is bishop b4, and white wins material. Uh, but my opponent didn't play bishop to d2. Uh, he played the most natural move here, queen takes c4. And now I no longer have this b5 move because then I would just hang a knight. But uh, I do have the move queen to d5. And this was pretty much the extent of my preparation. Uh, basically black is offering the queen trade. And I think what I prepared for Sasakuran was the queen retreating either to c3 or c2. And then generally black can reroute the queen to f5 or h5. Uh, eventually play knight to b4, rook d8, and it would be an interesting middle game. But in this position, my opponent played a move which I don't think I had checked a few days ago when preparing this line, is queen takes d5. And it does look like a very sensible option for white. White is simply trading queens, and after I take back on d5, my opponent plays bishop to f4. So developing the bishop and attacking my undefended pawn on c7. 
And here it does look a little bit uncomfortable for black because I basically have to choose between bishop d8 or knight e8 to defend the c7 pawn. Um, I didn't want to play bishop d6, allowing takes and takes. This would lead to a very ugly structure for black. And I end up going for knight e8 in this position. And even though it does look very passive and ugly, just putting my knight back on the 8th rank, uh, it does defend the pawn, and very often the knight can reroute to d6, where it combines very nicely with a pawn on d5. And I thought the position is actually pretty solid for black. Like, even though white has a lead in development, uh, my opponent continued here with knight c3, so all of white's minor pieces are developed, and meanwhile my pieces have some work to do. But the thing about this position is because queens are off the board, uh, I basically have time to regroup my pieces. And in this position, I played what I think is a very nice active move, knight to b4. Uh, defending the pawn and establishing the knight in white's territory. And I'm basically taking advantage of the fact that white's committed to a4, and a pawn can never return to a3. So uh, the knight can basically just stand on b4, and maybe at some point black can play a5 and establish outpost on the queen side. So going forward from here, my opponent plays rook a to c1, and then I play bishop to f5. So just trying to complete development, thought the bishop stands nicely here, and maybe there's ideas of bishop c2 at some point. Um, I was thinking that if white wants to maybe try and play positionally on the queen side with pawn a5, um, a very common idea is to follow up with knight a4 and knight c5, but if he ever tries to maneuver the knight to a4, I would have bishop c2 with the double attack. So instead, my opponent chose a different plan in this position. He played the move knight to e1. And uh, maybe he was just trying to mock me, given that I had played knight e8 a few moves ago. Uh, but there is some point behind this move. He is unleashing the bishop on g2 the Catalan bishop, and now he has two attackers against the pawn on d5. And it's very possible that he wants to maneuver the knight to d3 eventually and uh, get rid of my knight on b4. And in this position, I was mainly debating between two moves to defend this pawn. Uh, as a choice between rook to d8 or pawn to c6. And I didn't really want to commit to c6 right away because then I think white does have a4 here. And another benefit to the knight on e1 is he's controlling c2. So if I kind of commit to the structure, then white can then go for this knight a4 plan, not have to worry about bishop c2, and then try and invade my dark squares on the queen side. So I tried to be more flexible. I played the move rook to d8. So making sure I have two defenders uh, for the pawn on d5. Um, and then my opponent played a move pawn to f3. So this is perhaps another idea of knight e1, even though this looks really passive, given that he moved his knight back and now he's blocking his bishop, he really wants to expand in the center with pawn e4, and then just take over the center and gain time attacking my bishop on f5. And at first it looks like pawn e4 is difficult to stop because he has one, two, three, things supporting e4, I only have two things fighting for the square. But I was able to create some uh, threats in the position, and here I start with pawn to g5, attacking his bishop on f4. Uh, this prompted him to move back to e3, so blocking his e-pawn, and I improve with knight d6. He plays bishop to f2, so he's found a new home for the darks for bishop, and he's still having ideas of playing pawn e4, even though I have three things now controlling e4 uh, with three supporters, this move is certainly uh, still a viable threat in the position for white. So in this position, I played somewhat of a prophylactic move, uh, really just aimed to discourage him from playing e4. And the move I played was bishop to e6. And the idea of this move is that if he plays pawn e4, then I can take, and then if he takes back, I get a lot of initiative. I was calculating bishop to b3, uh, almost trapping his rook. He would have to play rook d2, and then I can play knight c4, and my pieces are all kind of 
crawling into white's territory again almost trapping the rook he would have to play rook e2 and i was calculating g4 here to threaten bishop g5 and go after the other rook and even though white has the two center pawns i thought that black has some really nice active play in the position really interesting harmony with the minor pieces and this move g4 prevents this knight from redeveloping and uh, this is probably why my opponent did not go for e4 in the game. So bishop e6 turned out to be just a nice move to keep control in the position. Now the drawback of this move is it did relinquish control over these squares and it did allow him to play knight to d3. So now he's offering the trade of knights and rather than trading immediately, I decided to leave the tension and I played knight to c4. So discovered defending my knight on b4, also trying to pressure white's b2 pawn. So here he responds with pawn b3, and then I maneuver the knight to a5. So it's kind of a weird path for what used to be my kingside knight. Uh, I went from f6 to e8 to d6 to c4, and now to a5. But I thought the knight stands nicely here, just pressuring his backward pawn on b3. And white has to figure out how to effectively defend the pawn. And here he started with knight takes b4. I take back with bishop. And then he plays knight to a2. So he's making some counterattacks. Back in my bishop on b4, also unleashing his rook. So hitting the c7 pawn. I drop back my bishop to defend the pawn. And then he plays rook to c3. So defending his b pawn. And so far, the game has been like very, very positional. But pretty soon, we're going to see how things get tactical. Uh, and here I play the move pawn to f5. So just trying to gain space on the king side. Um, and also really just trying to hamper white's expansion in the center. And after he played the move knight c1, I play the move pawn to f4. So gaining even more space and fixing white's pawn on f3. So now it's very difficult for this bishop to find life anytime soon. And if white ever moves e-pawn, I'll be ready to take and open the f-file. So I thought, uh, yeah, over the course of the last few moves, uh, black has made some nice positional gains. But the game continues, and he plays knight to d3. So centralizing the knight, and I put my rook on e8. Uh, basically, my thought process in this position was which piece can be improved the most, and this rook on d8 is really one of the few pieces not playing um, a real role in the position and moving it to e8 is just a much more useful square on the half open file and e2 is undefended so i'm trying to create as much pressure against white setup as possible and after rook e8 he plays king to f1 so making sure the e pawn has a defender and then i reply with rook to e7 so i'm really looking to double up and I wasn't sure if I actually want to double up on E file or maybe eventually the F file. So this was uh, a flexible move. I'm also over defending the C7 pawn. So if my bishop ever wants to like move away, then I won't be abandoning the pawn. And then he plays a move pawn to E3. So I think this move was maybe caused by the fact that it's not easy to figure out what to do as a white especially with a pawn on f4 uh, hampering white's pieces. So with pawn e3, he's just trying to get rid of this pawn so his pieces can have a bit more breathing room. But the problem with playing pawn e3 is it gives me some very interesting tactical ideas. And for the next several moves, I manage to seize the initiative. And here I start with pawn takes e3. And after bishop takes e3, his bishop is undefended and aligned with my rook on e file, and I strike with the move bishop to g4. So unleashing my rook, attacking the bishop, also attacking the f pawn, which is pinned on the f file. Pawn is attacked twice by rook and bishop, and very soon we're going to see that I convert my activity into a material advantage. Um, after my opponent plays king f2, trying to keep everything defended, I double up on f file. And now I have three attackers against the pawn on f3. And I should also note the pawn on f3 is pinned in two directions. There's absolute pin on f-file, 
but there's also the relative pin on the diagonal. So he can't play f4, that just blunders the rook on d1. So here he tried the move knight to e5, uh, trying to create some counterplay in the position. I take on e5, and after takes, I win the pawn on f3. After takes, takes king to e2. Uh, I did see this position from a distance. Uh, basically, back when I played bishop g4, I was calculating to this position, and it's somewhat hard to judge, because even though black won a pawn, it does seem like white has some decent counter chances, especially because he has two rooks on half open files, both targeting undefended pawns. And the only move I have here to keep both pawns defended is pawn c6. And I did end up playing this move, but the drawback of this move is all of my pawns are now on light squares on the queen side, and that really weakens the dark squares. And I have to be really careful about my knight getting trapped on a5, because if he ever can get in this move bishop b6, my knight is very short on squares. Now thankfully here, uh, his bishop is pinned to his rook, so bishop b6 immediately doesn't work. But he tried to prepare it with the move rook d to d3. And now the threat is very clear. He wants to play bishop b6 and trap my knight. And in this position, I had a few candidate moves. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was this move rook to f5. But I wasn't so sure about this, because after bishop b6 and then takes, and then let's say king to d2, I would be able to save my knight with the move pawn d4, uh, discover defense along the fifth rank. But then white can take, and I thought white has good compensation here with the position opened up and my knight's still on the edge, white still has initiative. So I played a different move in this position. Rather than dropping the rook back, I play the move pawn to b5. And this move, uh, I was very hesitant to play because it does weaken my c6 pawn. But at the same time, okay, the c6 pawn is defended by my knight, and I'm giving the knight a retreating square on b7. So I figured that I'm still keeping control, and I'm holding on to my extra pawn advantage. And if he plays a move bishop b6 here, which he didn't play in the game, uh, I would have taken on d3. And I think black has everything under control here. If he takes with rook, then I can move back. And yeah, the queen side is defended. If he moves here, I move here, and life would be fine. And if he takes with king here, then I can play rook d3 check and get rooks off the board. And again, uh, play knight b7. And I'm pretty sure black has very good winning chances in this position. Uh, the bishop can't touch any of my pawns, and the knight creates a nice wall where the white king can never infiltrate on the queen side. So going back to what happened in the game, in this position my opponent played pawn to e6. And this is a very bold move because he's trying to just make use of his pass pawn in the center. And this does have a pretty nasty threat of pawn e7 to hit my rook. And the rook on f8 is tied down to defending my rook on f3. So if he gets one more move and gets to play pawn e7, then black would be losing. So I had to be very careful here. And the move I played in response was actually pretty simple. I just moved my rook from f3 back to f6, attacking the pawn. And now the pawn is just pretty much uh, a big weakness for white rather than a strength. Um, he tried the move pawn to e7 here, but after rook e8, I am ready to snag the pawn. And in this position, I was expecting him to play bishop c5 to try and defend the pawn, uh, after which I would have played knight b7, hitting the bishop, and if bishop to a3, I think there's a nice move here, pawn a5, setting a pawn b4. Uh, basically forking, but also abstracting the bishop from defending e7. And yeah, I think white would be in very, very big trouble here. But he didn't go into this in the game. Instead, he played the move bishop to b6, attacking my knight on a5. And in this position, I found a really nice line to first take on e7 with check. And after rook e3, it still looks like white has some annoying counterplay in the position. If I take, then take, and my knight's hit, and the rook is ready to come in. 
But in this position, I found a nice move, rook f to e6, creating the battery on e file, and basically saying, oh no, my knight, uh, my opponent didn't dare take the knight, because if he does, uh, there is a winning tactic for black in this position, on to d4, forking the rooks, and if he takes on e6, I take with check, and I'll win the rook next move. So... Basically, when I played rook e6, uh, this was just able to simplify everything in my favor. Uh, he played a few more moves. He takes on e6. I take back. He plays king to d3. And it actually only gets worse for white, because here I have pawn to b4. Uh, kicking the rook back, he plays rook c2. And then I take on b3. So the knight was stuck on a5 for so many moves, but finally it's able to capture the b3 pawn and in this position black is up uh three pawns and it's basically just completely winning uh there's a nice trick here that if he tries rook to b2 um it does look like maybe my knight is close to getting trapped but i have to move pawn to c5 uh, simultaneously hitting the bishop also setting up pawn c4 so if rook b3 pawn c4 is winning um so yeah, when we got to this position, he played bishop to e3. I played knight a5, just saving my knight, consolidating, and he resigned in this position given that black is up three pawns and white pretty much has no counterplay. So I think overall, this was a nice positional game, uh, some nice tactics in the later stage of the middle game. And it definitely felt like I was in control the whole game. After neutralizing the opening, especially after the queen trade, I think uh, everything was pretty steady. So I didn't have a chance to check this game with the engine. And I will admit I'm a little bit tired, but maybe we can just quickly look at the engine graph of this game. I'll switch tabs here and we'll go over. This is official broadcast uh, page. I do link to this page in every description of the recap videos if you want to analyze on your own. But we'll go ahead and click this button and we can see that, yeah, uh, oh wow, look at this. Zero inaccuracy, zero mistakes, zero blunders. So according to Sockfish, pretty much a perfect game, 97% accuracy. Um, yeah, if we just go forward, uh, seems like things went actually pretty downhill for white pretty quickly, like right before move 42. So just zooming through, it was maybe close to level, but yeah, it definitely felt like I had a pull in the position, like slight edge for black. I was happy with this f5 idea, even though the engine doesn't like it, it prefers knight c6. But f5 just seemed very, very natural. Apparently white has f4 here. How does this work? Takes, takes, takes. White sacks a pawn, but okay, maybe get some counterplay. Yeah, that's hard to judge. Can't blame my opponent for, for not playing f4. I played knight c1, so I got an f4. And yeah, now the engine... Actually, the engine is still... Not crazy about black. And here, when I'm winning the pawn, it just says it's equal. Wow. Wow, it says white's, okay, slightly for choice after rook dd3. But okay, still like close to equal. e5, best move. After e6, yeah, around here, things went downhill. So bishop e6 just... Yeah, he may have, uh, I wonder if he overlooked rook e6. How does rook b7 work? Rook b7 takes, oh, d4, oh, that's funny. d4 and if uh, rook e8, king f7. Yeah, so maybe uh, white could have put up a lot more resistance in this position, rather than playing bishop b6, he had a takes b5. Ah, I see. After a b5, if I take back, then bishop c5, knight b7. 
And because we traded the A pawns, I don't have this A5, B4 idea. So what if I take with the C pawn? So if takes CB5, Bishop C5, Knight B7, Bishop A3, A5, ah, he can just go in. I'm not in time for B4. Wow. Yeah, so my opponent was holding on, like, even after his, e, his e7 pawn became weak. But uh, yeah, he just made like perhaps one careless move, and then things went downhill very quickly. Okay, so um, yeah, it was a long day for me. Um, but I'm happy to rebound, especially after yesterday. So thanks, everyone, for watching. As usual, if you have questions, leave them below. It's time for me to get some rest. And I'll see you guys soon for the next recap. Stay tuned.